this talk right here, 10 Commandments for Vibe Coding, Raising the Bar So It's Production Ready, it's designed for an audience just like you guys, mostly senior developers, but it's applicable to you know, other levels of developers, uh, people who are just getting started as well, and even to you know, principal developers. So I'm just going to get started with this. So first of all, what is Vibe Coding? Uh, this is a term that was coined earlier this year. It actually didn't exist before then. Now it's sort of a popular term. Uh, it was really popular, I guess, about a month ago. It's this idea of coding with AI, but not checking every single line of code that AI writes. So if you do exactly that, then that's more methodical coding. So that's a little bit of a difference there. And my belief is that you know, this idea of vibe coding is, is going to grow up to something that's production ready, as I said in, uh, earlier. And the way it's going to happen is either vibe coders, you know, more casual coders, are going to be senior you know, software engineers, senior software engineers, or software engineers will need to learn a little bit of vibe coding, maybe a mix of both. So that's what this talk is about exactly. And number one here is that you don't want to rely on it too much if you're a junior. And I want to emphasize this because if you're more of a junior person than some of you are, then I know that it's easy to make you know, big mistakes, architectural mistakes, not necessarily implementation mistakes, because AI will be able to take care of a lot of those, but more fundamental mistakes you know, at the beginning of the project or you know, uh, whatever task that you're working on. So it's important to use it slightly differently. You, know, you want to ask a lot of basic questions, fundamental questions, to understand what the project is about, how the project is structured, uh, to understand you know, a little bit better about the technology that you're using. I actually got some pushback on this point, like, you know, oh, you're discriminating against a junior. But that's not what I'm doing here. Because anyone can be a junior, depending on the context you're working on. For example, I'm not familiar with Rust. So if I'm working with Rust, I'm more of a junior. So I need to ask stuff like, should I use this framework versus this other framework? Number two is you want to learn to break down a large problem into smaller ones. This was true even before AI, and it's still applicable with vibe coding. So this is a quick example. It might be kind of hard to see, but it is an actual project I wanted to build, but it was too hard to build you know, with AI in a single shot. So I decided to simplify, and I kept simplifying it further and further until it was simple enough for AI to build. Another way to visualize this is like this. You start from point A. Whatever point A is, it could be nothing. It could be an empty state, or it could be you know, a particular commit in your project. And you want to get to point B. That might be implementing a feature, implementing a project, uh, fixing a bug, whatever that might be. If going from point A to point B directly is too hard, you need to somehow you know, break it down into manageable pieces so AI can take care of each one. Number three is you want to write a lot of tests. And I say this because as AI writes more and more code, naturally, AI will create more and more bugs. And there are you know, many different ways of dealing with them, uh, having good guardrails for AI, CI, CD, stuff like that too. But one important one is writing tests. And the way I like to see is if you have a lot of tests, then AI will know which parts of the code base are working exactly. So if you ask AI to solve a particular problem you know, by describing it, then it might have trouble because it has a large solution space to explore. But if you have good test coverage you know, with a bunch of test tweets, I'm just showing three of them here, even with some overlaps, the AI will be able to tell, OK, I know that these tests already pass. So I don't have to look at these particular parts in the solution space. Even if I have AI write these tests, you know, as long as you check them kind of at the high level, making sure there's no like, weird mockups or anything, then AI will know that those parts of the solution space, problem space, are already working. Then it's going to have a narrower solution space to explore. It's kind of a strange concept, but it, it works like charm, really. And another way I, I like to look at it is that code is really a liability. I'm not the first person who said it. 
So you want to be careful about you know, growing your code base in a manageable way. But if you look at tests, I like to see them more like an asset. Not, you know, not exactly, not always, uh, depending on like, how flaky they are and stuff like that. But if you write them right, then they become an asset. So why not write more of it? Number four is you don't want to exceed 400 lines of code for each file. This is not a hard and set rule. But I found that when a file becomes you know, 600 lines, 700 lines, or more, maybe a, sometimes 1,000 lines, it becomes harder for AI to you know, manage it, uh, read it, edit it, stuff like that. So I think this is a good rule of thumb for humans too anyway. So why not keep that? Number five, it, a little bit similar to the previous one, is you want to organize your code base well. You want to organize it so that you know, people can find uh, what they're looking for in a not so confusing way, but it's the same thing for AI. If you, if you organize it well uh, for people, naturally it should be organized you know, well for uh, AI to find whatever it's looking for as well. Number six is, this is a pretty fundamental one. You want to you know, move slow so you can go fast. This really, in my opinion, comes down to management, you know, CEO, CTO, whoever is in charge, to understand the value of growing your code base without growing too much tech debt. A little bit tech debt, that's unavoidable, that's inevitable, that's fine. But when you try to move too fast as management, right? You want to try to push your engineering, too, engineering team too fast and to try to implement too many things all at once, then it becomes a problem, too much tech debt. So you want to avoid that with or without AI. Number seven is you want to make architectural decisions carefully. And you might have noticed that some of these things are sort of dub positions, you know, as a software engineer, we should already be doing these things. But with AI, sometimes they become a lot more important, even more important or as important as before. For this one, what I would say is AI is helpful for making architectural decisions. You know, you, like I said, you can ask questions like, should I use this, this framework or this other framework? Should I use GCP, AWS, what are the trade-offs? You can get, you know, a lot of information from AI, you know, the past information as well as uh, relevant, you know, up-to-date information. So I recommend being uh, careful about that and getting help from AI to do that better. Number eight is you want to provide or let AI collect necessary context. A good example of this is um, I thought this was kind of you know a dull thing to do, but at the same time I realized you know not everyone knows how to do that. Is if you are working with you know, the latest framework or the latest API, the AI that you're using might not have enough training data on that particular version. So what you want to do is, you know, basically copy and paste the right parts of the documentation, you know, command A and control, contr command, a, command A and control A are your friends, I like to say, in the world of AI. So, you know, select all, copy everything, give it to AI, and make sure it has the right context. And you can say, based on this piece of documentation, can you create this thing? And that works pretty well. Number nine is you want to keep the provided context to a minimum. So it's true that you want to provide a lot of context, but only as long as it's relevant. Because what happens is when you try to provide too much context, the performance of any of these AI models starts to go down. So if you, know, if you provide, let's say, 100,000 characters, you know, 500,000 ca characters, whatever that might be, when it's too long, uh, it won't be able to fully utilize the given context all the time. The latest models, you know, the later uh, up-to-date models are able to um, handle longer context better. But still, it's a good rule of thumb to keep the minimum uh, context at the same time you know, as trying to provide the relevant context. Number 10, uh, the last one here for now is you want to go agentic. And what that means is, you know, obviously AI started with autocomplete and being able to answer any questions that you have, but it becomes a lot more powerful when it's agentic, which means it's able to take actions on your behalf. It's able to, you know, go to particular URLs or perform a search on the web, perform a search in your code base, uh, run Git commands, stuff like that. One particular thing I recommend is a little bit scary, but giving access to your terminal environment in a controlled way to your AI so that it's able to run things like git commands, github commands, so that you don't have to memorize you know, individual commands. You just need to know these things 
um, conceptually, and then you'll be able to just ask AI to run commands for you, like you know, run a bicycle for me and you know, identify this issue I'm running into. Number 11, uh, I'll bonus one, you don't have to do this one right now, but I think this is where the future is going, where you don't wanna just run an AI agent one at a time in the future. You wanna run maybe you know, 10 at a time, 100 at a time, 1,000 at a time, and eventually the only way to scale it that way is to provide either a containerized dev environment or a VMified dev environment for your AI agent so that it's able to not just write code, but also you know, test it, uh, maybe you know, test the UI of it through its computer use capabilities. I wanna close this talk with this chart that I created. Uh, I created it about a month ago, I think, and over time I, I've gotten good validation that this is a pretty accurate chart where vibe coding is pretty powerful by a non-technical person already. You know, if you're creating like a one-off project, you can create a lot of value really quickly but then it becomes harder and harder for you to manage the code base. But when it's done right by a technical person, then you can create a lot of value at the beginning, but also you know, keep going, you know, keep adding more value to your code base without having a lot of tech debt. And I think that's eventually what people want. And by a technical person, what I mean is essentially someone who's able to follow all of these commandments. So if you want to take a look at the blog post version of this talk or you know, more related posts like this, feel free to subscribe to my newsletter on the left. And if you want to check out another agentic and vibe coding uh, tool that I have been part of a team working on, it's called Amp Code. Feel free to check the link on the right. And thank you so much. So I was wondering for, um, you said that the AI agent will work better with lots of comprehensive tests. Right. So would TDD be a good methodology to use in this situation? Yeah, well, 100%. Uh, I don't personally, you know, always use them, but from uh, like hearing from people who have used TDD with AI, you know, agents, it works really, really well. Do you wipe code? Have you wipe coded as like a piece of software that you've published? Uh, I have. So a couple of things. One is an open source project uh, that I worked on for a while. It's sort of like a cloud code alternative just for an you know, experiment. Uh, I, I pretty much wipe coded the entire thing. I, I learned a lot of the lessons uh, here that way. Another one is more of a production code base. It's also another a cloud code alternative, I guess, you know, app code that I mentioned. Uh, that one, I'm a little bit more careful because I don't want to push code you know, into production. That's, um, that's not good. But at the same time, I don't always you know, read every single line of code. Like I have AI a lot, write a lot of the code. And then I ask a lot of questions like, you know, what, what does this file do? And uh, like, what, can you just walk me through the flow of this file? And that's often good enough. I, I don't have to like, sometimes I, I want to read every single line of code, but not always. What if you're creating tests with AI as well as code with AI? <laughs> what is the borderline of you're depending too much on AI? Right. So it, it is a strange concept. You know, some people say never, never have AI write tests because you can't have AI test AI's code. But it turns out you can, and it, I I can't like quite put my finger on like wh why that is. But I think it's it's just that it's a different way of kind of thinking about it. If you think about a human. A human is able to write your own code and also write tests to test your own code. And your code actually becomes better because when you write tests, you're kind of thinking about it in a different way. And it seems to be the same way with AI. But again, like, you, you don't want to be uh, too, too like, offhand like, um, with it. You, you want to examine the tests a little bit. You know, it, it writes like flaky tests sometimes. It writes uh, like mockups that just pass through. You, know, you don't want to do that, but you know you don't have to check every single line of code, in my opinion. Yeah, so what what is your recommendation for the containerized environment? Would you use Docker or like Bagger or anything? Any tool you recommend? Um, not any particular tool. It's really any environment that allows you to, you know, uh, have AI run tests, run the code. And if, if it has a, you know, UI, U, UI access, then that's a plus. So with a container, you might need to kind of 
use like an in-memory UI library, something like that. If you want to have you know, kind of UI uh, in the environment built in natively, then you might need to use a VM. But you know, I think any, any, of those long things, uh, any of those things that you mentioned are fine, like whether it's Dagger, uh, Gitpod, what else? Uh, you know, Podman, whatever you like to use. Docker, yeah. Uh, I think we're out of time. Thanks so much, everyone.